So everyone, welcome. My name is Mariah Roberts with The Difference Consulting, and I'm here today really just to um, help this breakout session uh, flow smoothly and to make sure that um, all of us get the most out of um, this virtual world that we are living in. Um, I feel very, very honored to be here today with two leaders in this field. Um, Mary Dale Oppert is a public health advisor with the International Rescue Committee, and Dr. Marlene Timmerman, professor of, professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Director of Women's Health at Aga Khan University. Um, before we hear from our presenters, I want to just remind you that we're all joining from, from all over the world. Connection can be a thing these days. Um, if you lose connection for some reason, just remember you can go back to livesinthebalancesummit.org, livesinthebalancesummit.org at any time to rejoin, um, to click back into our session. So with, with, without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, Mary Dale Oppert to uh, begin the presentation. Mary Dale, go right ahead. All right, thank you. And um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is uh, Mary Dale Oppert. I work with the International Rescue Committee. My background is uh, predominantly in epidemiology, um, but uh, more broadly, public health and outbreaks um, in humanitarian crises. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the themes from this uh, consortium. Uh, so with the International Rescue Committee uh, and, and how that has affected some of our work at the International Rescue Committee. And I'll just say that um, for a little bit of background on our organization, uh, we work in over 40 countries in the world, and mostly with um, displaced populations and refugees, providing clean water, shelter, healthcare, education, empowerment, and other services to support refugees and those displaced persons. Um, in the wake of COVID-19, we've had to really rethink and reshape our programming and develop response strategies that ensure we can continue to provide these services. Um, but there have been a lot of challenges and I'm gonna talk mostly uh, around uh, sexual and reproductive health services and also around what we've seen in terms of gender-based violence towards um, women, children, and adolescents. So as you know, there have been many uh, movement restrictions and lockdowns uh, in uh, many countries. And uh, as a result of this, we've seen increases in partner violence um, and simultaneously we've seen decreases in child protection reporting. Um, that's not to say that there are decreases in uh, the need for child protection reporting or um, the uh, uh, use of it, but um, usually these reports come through schools and community groups. Um, however, so uh, when we see women experiencing abuse, um, there's evidence to indicate that 60 to 75% of women experiencing abuse uh, also include children in the household who are experiencing abuse. So while women have access to hotlines and can report out, often children uh, do not have access to these services. Um, so as countries start to lift restrictions, just to say, I think um, in this outbreak, we're going to see a more of a landslide of protection issues. So I think it's more necessary than ever to start strengthening those social protection measures now and start reinforcing protection services. And I say that because um, we've seen this before in past epidemics, uh, specifically, I think West Africa in the Ebola epidemic, if anyone has um, experience with that, that's what we saw was um, as the outbreak decreased uh, in severity, the need for these services came rushing back. And that is also true for sexual and reproductive health services. So um, as these services have shut down due to supply chain issues, um, both at the international level, all the way down to the local level in the last mile, we've seen decreases in um, those at, in women, um, children and girls uh, accessing health services. And that has um, affected everything from um, vaccinations on a regular basis to um, sexual reproductive health services such as contraceptives, post-abortion and safe abortion care, clinical care for rape survivors, um, HIV and other STI prevention measures, and then deliveries in uh, health facilities have also decreased, um, which 
can uh, and will increase uh, morbidity and mortality um, in these humanitarian settings. So what we've tried to do in IRC is um, develop uh, ways it, both on the communication side and community engagement and then um, training in our organization with healthcare workers and community health workers that ensure that we can continue to provide uh, safe services um, protecting our staff and also protecting the beneficiaries that we um, serve. Some of those have included for uh, gender-based violence, uh, making sure that we are trying to decongest our safe spaces, holding outdoor meetings as much as possible, moving to remote case management as much as possible, but still for the most acute cases in GBV, um, we are doing home visits, but with reinforced infection prevention and control measures. So having personal protective equipment, you know, and uh, also doing social distancing. We've moved our psychosocial support to uh, mobile phones and hotlines um, and community-based models with more reinforced uh, infect infection prevention and control. And then on the health service side, um, both for sexual reproductive health and our normal health facility visits, um, we've reorganized our health facilities to ensure that clients are uh, not exposed to COVID patients and minimize the risk of transmission to our healthcare workers during those consultations. Mm -hmm. We've increased capacity for supplies for infection prevention control to ensure uh, safety of healthcare workers during those visits and consultations, um, and particularly around uh, the delivery of babies and other medical procedures that need to be done. Um, we've revised our service delivery protocols to bundle services as much as possible to reduce the frequency of visits and minimize the risk of transmission for healthcare workers and clients. And we've increased access to the knowledge and products needed for self-care as much as possible to reduce the, cell, the reliance on that, the burden of health facilities. And then finally, of course, we've really tried to preposition pre additional stocks of critical drugs, personal protective equipment, and other commodities that we know are going to be needed during this outbreak to ensure that we have ongoing supplies because of these, um, in case of these uh, supply chain disruptions that we know are happening. So just to okay. wrap up, there are many, many, many challenges to um, providing safe and accessible um, healthcare in the wake of this COVID outbreak. But uh, I think it's essential that we find solutions active, that are flexible, and that collaborate and coordinate with governments, NGOs, and our partners to find ways to provide those uh, services to um, and, and to ensure that we're safe for, you know, providing care for our staff, our clients, and our communities. And that's all on my side. I'll Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary Dale. Um, obviously, there's a lot more there, and we are going to have time for discussion later in this breakout. So um, we hope to pick your brain quite a bit more. Um, I, I want to um, ask now our second presenter, um, Dr. Marlene, um, to go ahead and fill in. I think she, you're going to be talking a bit about sort of on the ground and what you're seeing on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and unmute. Unmute, Dr. unmute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you and um, very happy to contribute to this session. So I'll introduce myself. I'm a gynecologist uh, working 40 years now in the field of uh, reproductive maternal and newborn health in many parts of the world, currently based in, um, in Kenya uh, for the last five years. And um, our president, when there was an outbreak, when the outbreak of uh, COVID started, President Kenyatta said about three months ago, we expect a baby boom in nine months because of the uh, mitigation measures and the lockdowns and the curfews and so on, which is maybe true. We are doing a study with Ministry of Health to follow that. But the biggest worry is it's not only the population, the, the baby boom, but the fact that we have reversed gains. We work very hard the world globally um, but before I came to Kenya, I was director of WHO of the Department of Reproductive Health and Research. And with the global community, we did really a lot to uh, increase antenatal care, to increase facility-based delivery with success in a number of countries and also in Kenya. But now we are seeing a reverse gain because of, because of COVID. 
um, women are, first of all, not always able to come to the facilities. Uh, in a very big maternity here in Nairobi, in the um, informal settlements, public health maternity, where we have normally about 80 deliveries a day, we are now counting only 40. Why is that? Because women don't get to the maternity because of curfew, limited transport, and many other reasons. Number two, because uh, people are scared. They are afraid to come to facilities. They think that facilities are spreading COVID and that you have to stay away from it. The other reason why we could have a baby boom is also because there is much, there is less access to contraceptives. So how do we respond from the healthcare sector, be it from Aga Khan University Hospital, be it from other facilities. We try to get um, family planning methods, not only for one year, but much longer to, to go to the long acting, but still this fragile population of young, young girls like in Matari and Kibera, they are the ones who are really vulnerable. They don't have uh, education, they don't have access and the worst thing, as it was said already by Mary Dell, we see that everywhere in the world. Our hypothesis initially was that the number of adolescent uh, pregnancies would go down because schools are closed, the young girls are not, uh, they are under parental control. So they have less, we have already before COVID, we, we had, uh, or we are having, uh, a very high rate of teenage pregnancies in most of the counties here and activities are going on in that area. However, now with COVID, we see that you probably to, um, the, the teenage pregnancies are going up and we have to find out why, maybe less protection, maybe one of the factors that surely plays a, plays a role globally is indeed the, the gender-based violence. And we hear um, reports of the, of the girls who are trapped in the houses of the aggressors, those who are supposed to protect them. Um, even before COVID, we are following gender-based violence victims and we have followed about 1,000 showing that more girls than boys, of course, but also young boys. And in the children's group and the very young ones, um, most of the perpetrators are neighbors, family, Friends, they are known, more than 80%. And now it's even worse because the girls cannot escape, cannot go anywhere, they cannot talk to, to anyone. So we really have to kind of, and I'm so happy with this, uh, this conference that we are joining uh, forces to look also in, not to close our eyes for the very vulnerable, but to try to, to support them. Now, what can be done? It's easier said than done, and that's why we have to come together. But I think just to close, we, the, 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 the health sector now, the public health sector, it's clear again that we have to invest in public health. Now it's everything goes to COVID. And before everything went to HIV and then everything went to Ebola in some of the areas. So it is actually the failure of the public health sector to deal with the emergency. It's not that they can do it on their own, but you need a real good basis and then you can end your vertical uh, program. So that is number one. Number two, I think we, uh, one of the good, by the way, one of the good uh, readings is the UNFPA um, um, publication, Reproductive Health for Communities in Crisis. Um, so this is just also highly recommended. Wonderful. And Dr. Marlene, of... Dr. Marlene, I'm so sorry. I want to give you just a, a heads up that because the whole conference is starting a little bit late, we want to jump into the next thing in just a sec. Yeah. So I will just close here and say that um, we have uh, a silver lining of commitment of the highest levels, at least in Kenya after the ICPD conference. Now we have to bring all the issues in relation to SRHR in this high political level and commit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there, there is not enough time. Uh, there is so much wisdom right here. And so what we want to do right now is give um, everyone who's involved and everyone who's watching right now um, uh, the ability to share your expertise together. Um, people are here from all over the world. 
um, where you're about to be sent out automatically, you don't have to do anything, um, into small breakout groups. Um, what that means is that you'll find yourself with about maybe eight other people. Um, I want you to just connect. This is unfacilitated. Um, and the question to think about is, what was most thought provoking for you about the presentations you just heard? Think of this as a time to connect and find out why did other folks come to this session? Okay, we'll see you back here in seven minutes. You don't have to do a thing. You'll just go and come back. Enjoy. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a wonderful conversation. I know um, I can only imagine uh, meeting people from all over the world who all chose to come to this group because they are passionate about it and about this topic. Um, what I'm gonna invite you to do now is to um, go ahead and open the chat in your Zoom. And just considering the conversation you just had, please feel free, not required, but feel free to chat in questions that you may have for our speakers. We have a, a, still have about 10 minutes in this session, never enough time. Um, and so as you're doing that, I'm going to start out by actually directing a question to uh, Mary Dale Oppert, um, uh, really around the implications of COVID-19 for humanitarian and fragile settings. And I wonder if you could speak to that while we invite our participants to add their own questions and voice. Thank you. Here, here. here we go. Um, Sure. Uh, so just to kind of piggyback on um, what I was talking about earlier in terms of um, the way that we've adapted some of our services and how it affects refugees. I mean, I think it's a double-edged sword because there are so many uh, other issues that uh, refugees and displaced populations are dealing with. Um, Often we see and hear that um, COVID is a concern, but it's not the only concern. And um, as Dr. Marlene was saying uh, at the end of uh, her presentation is that we really need to uh, take COVID into consideration, but find ways to continue providing uh, these other services that are so um, uh, very much in need for uh, refugees and displaced populations, but doing it in safe ways. So um, what that means for us, uh, I think as a community is finding uh, uh, strategies that are adaptive and they have to be context specific in terms of how governments are reacting as well. So it's not a one size fit all. I mean, uh, you know, so, and what we've seen in some instances, for example, under strict lockdowns, we may have to look at delivering um, medical supplies, you know, to people who cannot um, leave their homes. In other settings, uh, we may need to consider um, where, where delivery is not possible, um, continuing to have people uh, come to the health facilities, but do bundling, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of, you know, where we're seeing refugee populations, um, Cox Bazaar is a great example of where it's been really challenging um, and, and concerning both for our, um, our clients who are afraid sometimes to come to health facilities and for our health workers who are also afraid of getting COVID from some, you know, uh, from the people who are coming to them. So uh, we had to do risk communication and community engagement on both sides. Um, it's very difficult to socially distance in such a crowded area. So what, you know, we're trying to establish isolation areas for the most vulnerable populations, put in emergency hand washing stations where possible, um, and really train our uh, health workers and community health workers in the identification and detection of suspect cases. So I'll leave it there while I assume that some questions have come in. I'll pass it back to you. Mara. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And in fact, you know, you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, part of the implication is having to um, handle COVID while looking at the bigger picture and, and, the, and the full scope of needs um, in these settings. Um, and I wonder, um, uh, Dr. Marlene, um, specifically what the impact is in, in these types of settings on, for sexual and gender-based violence. I know that's something you think about. Uh, uh, thanks for that uh, question. Um, gender and sexual, um, gender-based violence has been with us 
since since a long time, and um, we know from WHO and other studies that one woman in three in her lifetime or girls are dealing with um, sexual violence. I've seen many, many uh, survivors of sexual violence and rape, and it is very traumatic. Now, um, th there are there are kind of this kind of progress of listening more to the girls, the women, protective measures, um, shelters for women and girls are more available than than 10 years ago, for example. And it shows very well that it is not a, only a health problem. Of course, mm -hmm. if somebody, a survivor, has to be given care, medical care, uh, treatment, prevention, HIV, and so on, then the mental support. But it shouldn't stop there. What we have done in some areas is really setting up a network with paralegals, uh, training mm -hmm. even the poorest and the lowest um, 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 educated girls and women about their rights. So we try to set up this, taking more now perpetrators to court, working with legislators, with communities. Also in Mombasa, for example, a large network with religious groups, community leaders, so that it is actually embedded in and becomes also in the schools mm -hmm. and educating the school girls from very young, every year there was a day that the schools come in the street and, and not with us and so on. But having said that, a lot of progress has been made and in COVID times, these girls are even more vulnerable. As I said before, they, they cannot leave their houses. They don't know what we saw recently in Kenya is also reports on more incest. So their own brothers, uncles, fathers, uh, actually abused them. And, um, and this is very, very difficult because also uh, the girl cannot do anything, even if the mother is aware, she has very limited power. She can leave the house, but then she's on the yeah. street. So it is a kind of, uh, with COVID, it's, it was already there, but with COVID it becomes much more outspoken. So we, we have to think as a community, how can we address that? And to start with, I was surprised to hear in the in the poll uh, with Helen Clark that I was number one, sixty four percent was the health services, right? But yeah. the rights are as important. The right not to get married as a girl child, the right to look for contraception, the right not to be raped. So we 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 yeah. have to to not to kind of put a silo on health and rights. It's very much interesting. Very, 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 very fascinating. And I, you know, in fact, it brings up, we have um, uh, Rebecca Herman from Pathfinder International who asked a question earlier. I want to just point out that we do have until 7.30. Um, so um, we have actually a couple more minutes than we thought we might, which is fabulous. Um, and so this is pointed to Marydale and it kind of um, points, it's a good continuation from what you were just saying, Dr. Marlene. And the question is um, around uh, whether IRC or others are, are um, doing any work to find adaptations to enable overnight protection services or shelter for youth needing to leave their homes mm -hmm. during stay at home order. So again, uh, you know, a, a, an issue that, that, is, that is always present, but how is that being dealt with during COVID? Mary yes. Dell. Um, in locations where it's feasible and safe, we are maintaining safe space programming uh, with some adaptations. So for example, in, uh, Tanzania in the Ntendeli camp. Uh, there are over 40,000 Burundian refugees there. Um, and the IRC teams are um, implementing physical distancing and access control measures. So temperature taking, hand washing stations uh, before entering these safe spaces um, at the, and these women's centers to continue supporting as many clients as possible. Um, but again, with physical distancing inside of these areas as well. So um, both our health facilities and our safe spaces have been adapted as much as possible to allow for social distancing. And also you have to set up those pre-screening areas um, uh, prior to entering for, you know, to identify any potential cases of COVID. Dr. Marlene, um, I'm sure you're seeing some sort of similar or related um, uh, responses uh, where you are. Can you speak to that? Sure. I think uh, from the health sector perspective, um, what we are trying to do, and there is um, 
an NGO in Kenya who has taken care for the moms who come to deliver, for example, they, with curfew, it's very difficult for them to move. So there, there are uh, systems set up for at least pregnant women because I think currently we, we, we have to do the research, but there, is, um, there are many women, maybe there are more women dying currently from not being able to, uh, pregnant women, to uh, access the health facilities than of COVID. So we have to make sure that we, we contribute and there are systems that have been set up to allow the women to come to facilities. Uh, much more difficult is of course for the, um, the young girls the, the, in, in, in vulnerable groups here in um, informal settings to, to, to be allowed to move around, to come to facilities, to look for health care. That is something that still needs to be addressed. And maybe we should learn from other epidemics. How did they do it in, COVID, in um, Ebola areas and so on? Because the same mitigation measures were there. And when, when as, as I tried to say, instead of moving from girls and women, uh, women and girls last, we should go again to women and girls first. Because now they are really the last of our kind of um, concerns. I mean, us in this community, yes. But out there, there are very little programs that are really focusing on women and girls and adolescents. Yes. So I'm happy with the call to action and I hope that yes. we are calling and shouting loud and that the call is really having an impact as well. And the call and the call is, and you know, Dr. Millian, thank you for chatting it in so anybody can see it. And we do save all of the chat so we have everyone's voice, but the call is moving from women and girls last to women and girls first. Um, yes. I want to invite um, our, our, our uh, Jack Burgess, who's helping us with all the tech, um, to actually launch a poll. We have just a few minutes more than we thought we might. And what I'm going to invite everyone to do um, is to, as soon as the poll uh, pops up, uh, go ahead and, uh, and respond. And this is, do you agree or disagree? Despite the challenges and disruptions created by the COVID-19 pandemic, it is still possible to ensure that women, children, and adolescents in humanitarian and fragile settings have access to the services and care they need. If you completely disagree, uh, so just pick one to five and we will get a temperature check on people's experience out there about 30 seconds for that. While you're doing that, let me just let everyone know that when this session ends, um, the easiest way to continue um, uh, participating in this summit, which again goes, um, there's another session today as well as some other networking opportunities to meet more people working in this field or interested in this field. You're just gonna go to lives in the summit, at livesinthebalancesummit.org, livesinthebalancesummit.org. Okay, so we're almost, uh, let's go ahead and end that poll, Jack. Okay, so it looks like for the most part, uh, it's actually a mixed bag, but it looks like people think it's somewhat possible. So we've got about four, four is the highlight. So thank you, Jack, for that. Um, Dr. Marlene and Mary Dale, just in the last minute that we have before we're done, do you want to comment on the poll? Feel free to jump in. Um, sure, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, just to say that I would probably put myself at a four as well. While I think it is possible and absolutely necessary that we um, continue to strive towards providing all of the health services that we can, there are obviously some huge challenges and um, that, is, that comes from uh, government restrictions, that comes from the breakdowns in supply chains, um, it also comes from uh, focusing on a pandemic uh, and letting that draw away our attention from the essential health services that uh, need to be available and accessible and at all times, um, not just uh, when there is not a pandemic. Yeah. Um, Maybe a Thank you. quick one from from my side, I was doubting between a three and a four because uh, is it still possible to ensure, I think even before COVID, it is our 
it is or means difficult to ensure yes. that they have access to the services they need. And now bringing COVID in, you can spend a dollar or a euro or whatever only once. So all the effort that goes to COVID now has to be kind of met by the already existing needs. So I would yes. definitely not give it more than a four. Thanks. Thank but you so much. It. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's, it's wonderful and fascinating that, you know, in fact, um, you know, the, the, uh, your experience, uh, it sounds like really echoes what our participants' experience is as well. So, so that's a really interesting temperature check to get. Um, so everyone, uh, thank you so much. Again, I think uh, if we could summarize this amazing session, it is moving women and from moving from women and girls last to women and girls first. Um, we thank our presenters uh, so very much. Uh, this will be available on video. Um, uh, so if you wanted to share it later with somebody, you are welcome to do that. That will be um, available at the website. Um, please do uh, know that uh, this will now uh, end, this meeting will end. Um, and uh, for anyone who wishes to um, continue uh, enjoying this wonderful summit, you're just gonna go to lives in the balance summit.org. Um, the headlines and Mary Dale's report in plenary in the live stream uh, will happen shortly. So do tune in um, and hear uh, her report of this conversation. Thank you, everyone.